Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. And I thought that I'd start with an anecdote, a personal anecdote. So uh, some of you may have heard this before, but um, and this is particularly pertinent to today's Grand Rounds. My daughter moved to England um, almost a year ago. And shortly after she moved there, she discovered she was pregnant. She was immediately signed up with the National Health Service. She was seen by a midwife um, at uh, regular intervals, had her ultrasounds, and then had a home delivery that was attended by two midwives. Uh, afterwards, during the time that I was there, a health visitor came by and looked at the baby, did all the usual type of five week milestone things, you know, asked my daughter how everything was going, um, you know, gave her some information and some advice on this, that, and the other. This was uh, no questions asked. How long have you known you were pregnant? You know, do you have any other medical conditions that would make it difficult for us to insure you? Or uh, anything um, of that nature. And fortunately, she did very fine and has an absolutely beautiful baby. So, um, apropos to that, I'm very excited about today's Grand Rounds. And to introduce our guest speaker, um, I'm going to ask Dr. Barb Casper to come up here to the podium um, and introduce her. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our Grand Round speaker as our Division Chief, Dr. Christian Furman, is out of the country. Dr. Margaret Flowers completed her undergraduate degree at Georgetown University, followed by her medical degree at the University of Maryland. She subsequently completed her residency training in pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University. So you might wonder why she's speaking at uh, Medicine Grand Rounds, but that will be uh, evident uh, soon. While practicing pediatrics in Maryland, she became extremely interested in health disparities as well as the potential for a single payer system to address those disparities. Dr. Flowers has testified in front of Congress multiple times to try to establish support for a single payer system. She has also appeared on numerous documentaries and on national television programs such as MSNBC, Frontline, and Bill Moyers. She is dedicated to the principle that all people deserve access to health care, and we were delighted that she is able to join us today. And her topic will be health care, a business or a public good. Dr. Flowers. Thank you. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Great, well, congratulations on your baby. It's exciting. And uh, thank you for having me this, here this morning. I'm gonna run through you know, the slides and I hope to have some time left for some questions at the end. Let me just give you kind of a warning. Um, the first part of the presentation is not the happiest presentation. <laughs> it's, um, we're gonna talk about the state of our current healthcare system. And it's important that we understand what that current situation is so that we know how to change it. So um, I'm sorry if I'm going to hit you with a lot of facts that are not that happy, but if you've been feeling dissatisfied with our healthcare system, maybe you'll understand a little bit more about why that is and know that you're not alone, that there's a reason for it. So I don't have any financial relationships to disclaim and objectives. By the end of this, I hope that you'll be able to describe some of the like uh, highlights of our health insurance reform in the United States, also have an understanding of the challenges that we face in this current system, and what it would actually look like if we treated health care as a public good in the U.S. So let's start with some history. The 1940s was an interesting time because in European countries, there was a lot of devastation due to the wars, and they had to really rebuild. And when they rebuilt their social systems, many of the countries rebuilt uh, healthcare systems that were based on treating healthcare as a public good. On the other side of the Atlantic in the United States, we had a situation where businesses were not allowed to raise wages during the war, and so they started offering health benefits to attract employees. And that created the marriage between employment and health insurance in the United States, which, which is still how most people get their health insurance. And that was never really meant to be a basis of a system. Um, of course, it creates problems because when people get sick and can't work, they are at risk of losing their health insurance. Um, then in 1965, I like to point out that we did pass Medicare and Medicaid uh, from scratch. We had to create them completely new in a very short time, in 11 months, 
oh, almost 19 million seniors were enrolled in Medicare using little uh, basically index cards. There was no computers to, do, to help with that. Then in 1973, there started to be a real change in how we treated healthcare in the United States with the passage of the Health Maintenance Organization Act by President Nixon. This actually codified into law that people could now profit off of the healthcare system. So hospitals, private insurers could operate for profit. And President Reagan really took this on with a fury and actually invited investment houses into the Department of Health and Human Services to train them on how to take over healthcare as a profit-making venture. And the 1980s is when I was doing my medical school. And I, I, some of you who are similar in age may have noticed it, the change in language. I remember when we went from calling patients patients, and then we were supposed to start calling them clients or thinking of them as consumers and really using market, market language around healthcare. Um, 2009 is when we had the health reform uh, process in Congress that resulted in the Affordable Care Act. And this is actually the cover of The Lancet in December of 2009, as the Senate was trying, working furiously to pass their part of the legislation. And the cover says the health care reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the U.S. government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence and the public interest. And I was uh, volunteering full time then as a congressional fellow for Physicians for National Health Program and was in Congress pretty much every day. And I can concur that that's what was going on. So where is the United States when we look at you know, how we compare with other countries? The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, does health statistics regularly. And this chart basically lists the countries on the left-hand side. The United States is the second one from the bottom. And it's, the bars are what percentage of the population is covered. And you can see that in mo many countries, it's 100% coverage or close to that. And then the different colors of the bars, the orange is for public coverage, and then the lighter orange is for private. And you can see that the United States stands out and that we have a significant part of our population that is not covered, and we also have quite a lot uh, larger percentage that's covered under private and not public. So in this system that we have in the United States, um, you know, what are, how are we doing? What are, how, what are we getting with this system? And the OECD found that we spend on the, in the U.S. twice as much per capita per year as the average OECD country. And so this uh, graph just compares some of the, uh, some of the countries. And the U.K., uh, France, I'm sorry, Japan, France, Australia are the, pretty much the top systems in the world. And you can see that we spend in public dollars, the yellow portion, more per person per year than Japan, France, Canada spend total on their population and they have better health outcomes and they're covering more people. Um, why is our system so expensive? Well, part of it is the cost of drugs in the United States. And this is a chart that just shows our spending on prescription drugs. And people often say, oh, well, that's probably because we prescribe so many more drugs in the United States. But actually, our utilization is pretty comparable to other wealthy nations. What's different in the United States is that we don't have a system that actually negotiates with the pharmaceutical companies. So it's basically whatever the market lets them get away with, that's what they charge. And so we spend sometimes two and three times more than what they spend in other countries for the same medications. And another problem with having you know, the pharmaceutical sector of our health system being really based on the market is that the pharmaceutical companies are really just interested in making a profit. And so this is a um, article that was just out in the prospect talking about how many of the pharmaceutical companies are not doing research in antibiotics anymore because antibiotics don't pay as well as other drugs. Antibiotics cure people and they'd rather focus on drugs that people have to keep using regularly. And so um, that research is not happening. And there have been actually uh, steps taken by the government to try to incentivize pharmaceutical companies to do antibiotic research, more money for research, longer patent times, but they're still dropping, uh, dropping that area. 
Um, in the United States, another reason that our healthcare system is so expensive is that we have a very bureaucratic system. So this is a chart at the bottom. In the yellow, you can see the rise in physicians over time. And then in the blue, the rise in administrators over time. And I don't know about you, but when I was in medical practice, I did feel like there was a mountain of administrators sitting on top of me, all the paperwork and authorizations and things that we had to do. And this has resulted in a very complicated system in the US. We have thousands of different insurance plans. They have different rules. Employers need people to decipher it. Hospitals need staff to interact with the insurance companies. Our practices, we spend over $80,000 per physician per year just on paperwork and you know billing to interface with all of these. And so about a third of our healthcare dollars is going to paperwork and not into direct patient care. And as uh, the other chart showed, we're not covering everyone. And I like to show this graph because it really gives you kind of a history of health insurance coverage. This is number of people that in the millions that are uh, uncovered, uninsured all year. And you can see that it was you know, very high around World War II, uh, started to decline as we got a lot of kind of association plans and employer plans. Then in 1965, we saw a significant drop with Medicare and Medicaid. And it started to head back up again um, in the 1980s, 90s, and so on to another crisis level in the mid, you know, 2007, 2008. We had about five, uh, 50 million people who were uninsured. In comes the Affordable Care Act. We see some drop in the number of people who are uninsured. But as we kind of predicted at that time when the ACA passed, that number has kind of leveled off. It, we had, uh, I think, about 4 million more people who became uninsured overall in 2016. 2017 stayed pretty steady. But we're pretty much anticipating that the number of people that are uninsured is either going to stay steady or continue to rise slowly over the next couple of years if we stay in the same course that we're on right now. And another uh, trend in the United States is that in addition to people without insurance, we're seeing a growing proportion of patients who are underinsured. So these are people who have health insurance, but the cost of the dedu deductibles is more than 10%, or the, sorry, the cost of their healthcare spending is more than 10% of their income, or if they're low income, uh, more than 5%, or the cost of the deductibles alone is more than 5% of their income, they qualify as being underinsured. And the once gold standard employer health insurance is moving in the direction of greater underinsurance. So as healthcare costs continue to rise, employers are moving more towards these high deductible plans that have high deductibles, high, high uh, co-pays for patients, shifting more of that burden onto the employees. And what does that mean? When we look at the current wages in the United States, this chart looks at the graph in wages based on the bottom 20% and all, each of the 20% going up. And you can see that over time, those wages have stayed pretty flat. So healthcare costs are going up, more costs are being shifted on to people, education costs are high, cost of housing is high, um, and the wages are not keeping up with that. And what this means is that a lot of families are not able to afford those out-of-pocket costs. So this is looking at non-poor uh, populations who have health insurance in the blue and who don't have health insurance in the yellow. And you can see that almost 50% of non-poor families don't have the money on hand to meet their deductible. And 61% don't have the money on hand to meet, is it, or 63%, to meet their out-of-pocket costs. So what happens in this situation is that people, as we know, are delaying or avoiding the care that they need. And this is a, an older study that just looked at what happens when patients have to make a financial decision about care. How does that impact their utilization? And they looked at the pediatric population. So the blue is children age zero to four, and then yellow is age five to 13. And you can see on the left that when there are no financial barriers to care, most of the children are getting care. This is the percent that went without a visit in the past year. And so you can see it's very low, 5% of the younger children and 15% of older children went without a visit. But as we start to add on more cost uh, up front before they get that care, fewer and fewer are being seen by doctors. And there was another study, I don't have it up here, but the RAND Corporation did it. It's a pretty uh, classic study where they looked at uh, 
financial barriers to care and how that impacted behavior. And they found that across the socioeconomic spectrum, people were just as likely to avoid necessary care as unnecessary care. So no matter what your education level was, people were not very good at deciding before they sought care whether it was something they really needed or didn't need. Um, and so what happens when we forego necessary care that we can take the risk of having a worse outcome or a more expensive recovery. This was a kind of a natural study. It was interesting. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, put in place a tax on what's called Cadillac plans. I, Cadillac plans are what we used to just call the basic employer plans that we used to have. And, and so this was an incentive for companies to drop those Cadillac plans and move to these higher deductible plans. So this was a business that had 150,000 employees. They moved to a high deductible plan. And then they looked back at how that changed the utilization of their employees. And they found that pretty much across the board, there was a decrease in utilization of services and that there was no evidence of patients actually shopping around for, you know, to get a better deal. That that really doesn't happen. Um, you know, we operate within insurance plans that have restricted networks. And so there's not a lot of choice there where you're going to get your care. And often when people come in for acute or emergent care, there's no shopping around at all, right? Um, in the United States, we have bankruptcies due to medical illness. The greatest cause of personal bankruptcy in the U.S. is medical illness. And while that has dropped some under the Affordable Care Act, it continues to happen. And this was a study that showed that the majority of people who went bankrupt from medical illness had health insurance when they first became ill. So about 78% had some form of health insurance and still went bankrupt. Um, this is where I tell you, just sorry, that's bad news, bad news, but we'll get to a happier place, I promise. Um, we have a lot of excess deaths in the United States just from being uninsured. So this was a study done by uh, Steffi Woolhandler and David Himmelstein looking at what was the number of excess deaths just because of not having health insurance, and they break it out by state. So in 2016, about 36, over 36,000 people died just from lack of health insurance. The photo on the right is actually a project that we did back in 2009 on the National Mall when we wanted to bring attention to this. We put flags in the ground for each, uh, each flag represented 10 people who died due to lack of health insurance, and we broke it out by state uh, so people could see how long those lines of flags went. We had that up for a whole week and had a lot of really interesting conversations as people came around to check that out. And this young woman who's now a teenager, uh, helped me out with putting the flags up. Uh, this is a study done back in 2008, looking at 19 of the top healthcare systems or 19 comparable healthcare systems in wealthy countries, and looking at if each of these symptom, systems functioned as well as the top three, how many deaths would be prevented? And the United States performed the poorly, the poorest out of the 19. They estimated that if we had a top healthcare system we would save over 101,000 lives a year. But even if we were just average, we would save 75,000 lives a year. So how do we compare to other countries on some important indica indicators? If we look at life expectancy, the US is on the left. Uh, we're not doing as well as other countries are doing. In fact, for the past two years, life expectancy has started decreasing in the United States. And that's the first time that's happened since the 1960s. If we look at infant mortality, we are at fairly high infant mortality rates, and there are pockets around the United States where we have very high uh, rates of infant mortality that rival what we see in developing nations. And then mat maternal mortality is very concerning. Um, if you look at the United States with uh, 26.4 deaths per 100,000 births compared to Canada, France, the UK, um, in fact, the U.S. News and World Report just did a report uh, this summer where they said that the United States is the most dangerous country to have an, a baby. And basically, the, the main drivers of that were eclampsia and maternal hemorrhage, two conditions that could be prevented. Uh, they found that hospitals just weren't doing the basics of, uh, of monitoring uh, blood output after delivery. Um, monitoring blood pressure well. 
So we're also in the US um, losing essential programs. I don't know if you're experiencing this here in Kentucky. In Maryland, we have a corporation, it's a not-for-profit corporation called MedStar that owns 10 of our hospitals. And in the city of Baltimore, they are shutting down essential services. They, with very little notice, they gave the uh, OB department at one hospital one day's notice that they were shutting down their residency program. At the same hospital, they gave the whole pediatric staff three days notice that they were shutting down the pediatric program. That was a, is a hospital that was serving, uh, half of their pediatric patients were Medicaid patients um, who now have to travel 15 miles on public transportation uh, to go to the nearest hospital that has a pediatric emergency room. Um, shutting down internal medicine practices and they're, they're at the same time building more outpatient surgery centers, moving more towards orthopedics and cardiovascular. Uh, and th when they were asked about why they're doing this, they say, well, it's a business decision. So at this um, one hospital where they shut the pediatric department down with three days notice, the CEO of the hospital makes $1.2 million. They claim that the pediatric department was losing $200,000 a year. They had just asked the state legislature for $20 million to build an outpatient surgical center you think they could have asked the state for maybe an extra million to keep the pediatric department open, um, but that wasn't their priority. And we're losing hospitals. This looks at a map of where hospitals are shutting down in the US. 83 hospitals have closed since 2010, and you can see that a lot of those are in the southern part of the United States, southeastern part. And finally, we're losing physicians. Uh, burnout is becoming more and more of a problem. And when we look at what is causing that burnout, what positions indicate is the computerization, having to use an electronic health system that's not actually designed around health, it's designed around billing, um, working too many hours, and uh, all of the bureaucratic ta tasks. Um, doctors are spending significantly more time on paperwork, which takes away from our time actually being face-to-face -face with our patients. And that was part of the reason I left practice after 17 years was uh, I didn't feel like I could provide high quality care when I was being pushed to spend less and less time with my patient. So if we looked at the United States as an experiment, the only industrialized country in the world that has a market-based healthcare system, I think that we would have ended it a few decades ago based on ethical reasons. Um, it's the most expensive. We have relatively poor outcomes. Didn't get into it too deeply, but we have disparities, high numbers of preventable deaths, we're losing our doctors, and we have uninsured and a growing number of underinsured people. So let's think, look a little bit about what the kind of spectrum of health systems is. And uh, here we go. So some countries use a purely public system, that would be the United Kingdom or our own VA system in the United States, where the government owns the hospitals, employs the physicians, uh, you know, owns the whole system. Then there are systems like Medicare, where the, it's publicly financed through taxes, but the delivery of care is both public and private. Then we see the mandate model, which is what the Affordable Care Act was, which is mandating that people purchase private insurance if they're not part of the public system, and then using public dollars to subsidize the purchase of that insurance. Or going to a purely market model, which is kind of where we're headed right now, and I'll get into that in a little bit, where it's, it's all done by privatized, you know, under private entities. As I mentioned, the Affordable Care Act is a mandate model. It was basically a Medicaid expansion, which was the bulk of the newly insured was under the Medicaid uh, private insurance mandate, public dollars. And when we were in Congress, the private insurers, you know, always said, well, oh, yeah, if you this is our trade-off, you know, we'll accept some regulation if you, if you mandate that people purchase our product. And actually, if you think about, it, not only did the U.S. government mandate that people purchase private insurance, but we set up marketplaces for them to sell it, and we hired navigators to help them sell their private insurance. And so under the Affordable Care Act, we basically codified into law a tiered system where people either get platinum, gold, silver, bronze, or catastrophic health care plans. And so if if you have some you know, health problems and you can afford it, you're probably gonna buy one of the platinum plans where your out-of-pocket costs are lower, but your premiums are higher. If you are relatively healthy or don't have the money, you're gonna gravitate towards the lower premiums and higher out-of-pocket costs. 
about 80% of people are buying the bronze and silver plans, leaving them with very high deductibles. And then the insurance companies, they're always a few steps ahead of us, right? So under the Affordable Care Act, they, they said, well, as an insurance company, you can no longer deny somebody a policy if they have a pre-existing condition. So what did the insurance companies do? They said, okay, but now we're creating ultra narrow networks that exclude 70% of the providers, including major medical centers. So if somebody has a significant health problem, they have a difficult time finding a provider who's in network so that it's covered. And I call it a crapshoot uh, because when people are choosing these plans, they really don't have any idea how they're going to work for them. Um, I, I talked to one member of Congress who said, "I think my patients or my constituents just ultimately throw a dart at the at the you know paper and figure out which plan it is based on that. You can't really decide." And so in Massachusetts, which started a plan similar to the Affordable Care Act back in 2006, they compared two bronze or a number of bronze plans. Sorry. Um, there we go. Um, so if you were in Plan C bronze and you had breast cancer, you were going to spend almost $13,000 a year. But if you had picked Plan G, it would have been only $8,000 a year. But if you had diabetes and you picked Plan C, it was going to be cheaper, $960, and under Plan G, $4,300. So you know, this is Nobody, there's no transparency with there. There's no way for people to determine ahead of time which plan is better for them. Uh, we're seeing increasing privatization of our healthcare system. So Medicaid, uh, more than 75% of Medicaid enrollees are in private managed care organizations. And Medicare has both, oh, sorry. Medicare, uh, original Medicare, and then Medicare Advantage plans, which are private insurance plans. Under the Affordable Care Act, we've seen an increase in this number of seniors who are in these Medicare Advantage plans. And when I look at kind of the, the industry publications, I like to follow those from time to time, they're actually becoming more aggressive in their marketing of the Medicare Advantage plans, and they hope to have a 5% increase in this year alone. And we're seeing a consolidation of our healthcare system, something called vertical integration, where private corporations own the hospitals, the practices, laboratories, long-term care facilities. They have their own Medicare Advantage plans, their own Medicaid MCOs, their own private insurance. And so really taking over a bigger you know, cross-section of the healthcare system, which gives them a tremendous amount of power. In uh, Baltimore, we had a situation with a family or internal medicine doctor who saw a lot of Medicaid patients and was giving them a good amount of care. And so the hospital where he worked had its own Medicaid plan where most of his patients were enrolled, they just dropped him. He was spending too much money. So he lost half of his patient base in a month. Uh, let's see, here we go. So if this is our healthcare system, um, we're, you know, this cartoon says we tried every fix the insurance companies will allow, but it still won't fly. So we must have to ask ourselves, what actually is going to get this plane off the ground? How do we start really getting at the root causes of the problems with our healthcare system and turn it around? And I argue that the smallest increment that, of change that we can make in the United States is to create a coherent system, an actual healthcare system where health is the bottom line of that system, where we treat health as a public good, and then we need the money to pay for it. And we'll go into that in more detail. Dr. David Barton Smith, who's a health historian, has written about the five phases of health reform over the last 100 years. And he says, each time we compromised, instead of getting at the real roots of the problem, and so we haven't solved the situation yet, he says that the two uh, fundamental changes we need to make is we need to have a compulsory system. So not an opt-in system, like the Affordable Care Act, where people have the option. They're mandated, or you can you know, pay a penalty if you don't get private insurance. Under a compulsory system, everybody is in from birth to death. You're in the system. And then we need the ability to regulate it. And we're having a hard time doing that with the current private insurers. So we advocate for a plan that uh, was written by the Physicians Working Group, uh, which is a group in Physicians for National Health Program. And you know, if we looked at kind of that spectrum of health reform, we could have had a real debate in the United States back in 2009, 2010. We could have looked at our three systems, the VA system, a purely socialized system, Medicare, which is a 
you know, publicly financed, but publicly privately delivered, or our market market based system. We could have really compared how that works. But if we look at the VA, um, if we had moved to a system like a VA, we know that it's health disparities start to disappear under the VA. And this was a study of over 3 million vets um, where they looked at total mortality and new, you know, cardiovascular events and strokes. And while we know that in the civilian population, mortality rates and, and uh, cardiovascular disease rates are higher in African Americans, in the VA system, mortality rates were actually lower and new cardiovascular events were actually lower for African Americans. So what are the basics of a national improved Medicare for all, which is what we advocate for at Physicians for National Health Program? It's a unified risk pool. Everybody's in the system. From the time you're born, you're just automatically in. Um, everybody contributes based on your ability to pay. In the US, we're one of the most regressive. We're ranked 54th in the world for fairness of financing. So the lower your income, the higher proportion of your income you're spending on health care. All medically necessary care is covered. It's comprehensive. I like to say we need to stop practicing body part medicine. We can't say we're going to cover this part of you, but not that. You know, we're going to cover your heart, but not your teeth or your brain or your ears. Um, we need to, you know, cover what people need. It's all related. We need to remove for-profit care. Uh, I didn't go into that, but there are numerous studies showing that for-profit care is more expensive and has poorer outcomes. We need a simplified administration. That makes it easier for patients. It makes it easier for us, for us as physicians, uh, but also saves a lot of money. People need their choice of physician and treatment without private health insurance companies standing in the way uh, between them and that. We need to focus more on preventative and timely care. And so getting rid of financial barriers to care is one way that we can make sure that patients are more likely to seek care when they need it. We need transparency and accountability. We need to know how our healthcare dollars are being spent. You may be aware that this past year, uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services was going to give analysts access to the data on Medicare Advantage plans. We don't actually have access to that data. We don't know how they're spending our federal dollars. Um, and then the Medicare Advantage plans were able to get out of that finagle, not releasing that data. Um, we need to know how that money is being spent, and we need a coordinated healthcare system so that we can stop hospital closures. We can say, you know, make sure that we have facilities available to all populations who need them. So the legislation that we advocate for is called HR 676, or we call it the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act. It's been introduced in Congress every session since 2003. And this is what it covers. Um, it's portable. It goes wherever you are. If you change jobs, if you move, if you travel, wherever you are, uh, the system goes with, or the coverage goes with you. And this is a list of what it covers, uh, basic, you know, primary and preventive care, inpatient, outpatient. Uh, it includes long-term care, uh, mental health, dental, eyes, and substance abuse treatment. And how would it operate for a hospital? Hospitals would get global budgets. They would negotiate with the system for an operating budget and makes things very simple. You get one check every month, and that's it. You, if you need to uh, expand or, or purchase new technology, you would apply to the system, and the system could look at whether that was actually needed for your area. Instead, we see kind of this hospital arms race. I don't know if you experienced that here, where one hospital will get a new technology. They'll start marketing it, getting patients to come in and use that, and hospital over on the other side of town says, oh, look, they're getting all of those people. We should do that too. And it's not necessarily needed for that community. And in fact, when hospitals are duplicating services, what we see is a sort of dilution of the patients going to those hospitals. So if we had you know, a cardiac center that specialized in cardiac, we know that when teams do the same thing over and over, see a certain patient population, that they get much better at it. They get more efficient. They can lower costs. Uh, so moving more towards a model of clinical centers of clinical excellence. Um, so why are global budgets good? They uh, maximize our administrative savings. We're no longer keeping track of every Band-Aid and every aspirin. Uh, it equalizes out services. So we're not saying, well, we make more on ortho, so we should do more of that and less of psychiatry. And then how would doctors be paid? There are three options under HR 676, a fee for service. Uh, Physician organizations would negotiate with the system. 
And then you could also be capitated with certain restrictions. So a health maintenance organization that's not for profit like a Kaiser that owns and operates its own facilities and employs its doctors could continue to operate as a capitated sort of system, but people have to have the freedom to go in and out of that as they choose. Or uh, you can have a globally budgeted institution where the physicians are paid a salary. So those are the three options for physician payment. And how do we know that this will work? So as I said, we're spending twice as much per person per year as other industrialized nations who cover everyone and have better health outcomes. So we're already paying for a universal healthcare system. We're just not getting it. There have been a lot of studies at the national level as well as at the state level looking at how these systems would function financially. And I just pulled this one out where they, this was done on California a number of years ago where they looked at the additional costs of covering people who are uninsured or poorly insured, eliminating co-pays and deductibles would be offset by the savings that we could get by bulk purchasing, negotiating for fair prices for goods and services, reducing administrative costs, and being able to see how the healthcare dollars are being spent and where there might be areas of fraud. And so they actually anticipated a net savings of 4.3%. And then people often ask about workers. So what's going to happen to all those people that are doing hospital billing and administration right now, that big mountain that we saw earlier? Well, about 400,000 people are doing uh, health insurance administration positions. And then we have about 1.3 million others who are employed doing other administrative types of jobs. So that would be about 1.7 million people who would be displaced by the new system. But there are um, you know, physicians and nurses and other you know, health providers who have left practice to go into these administrative positions out of frustration with the current system that we're in. We hope those people would come back into providing health care. But if they don't, if people are not hired into the new system, then they would get income support and job retraining to help them. But if we put it in perspective, about every year in the US, 60 million people are displaced from their jobs some through firing or through other reasons. So if we look at that, 1.7 million people losing their jobs is about the number who are fired every 31 days. So we already have this big turnover in the United States. It's not the big tragedy that it sounds like. And so finally, how do we know it can be done? Well, every other industrialized nation has a healthcare system that pretty much assures healthcare for everyone. They all spend less than we do. Most of them spend less than half. They have lower death rates, more accountability, higher satisfaction, and no country's ever gone to a single payer type of system and said, oh, we don't like it. We're going for a market-based system. So I'll conclude there, and thank you for listening. Well, any, no system is perfect in the world, and if you go to any country, they're going to have complaints about their healthcare system. Um, I guess this is just the reality of any system, is that we always have to be making sure that it's doing what we want it to be doing and pushing to improve it and change it. Um, so with a single-payer system, we're going to have to fight, like other countries do, uh, defunding of it and you know, making sure that we're getting the resources that we need, that it's covering what we need. I mean, we always have to be vigilant.
Right. Yeah, thank you for those questions. So Medicare Advantage, it's very difficult. The, the private insurance companies who sell Medicare Advantage plans are very savvy. Um, they market them very heavily. They tell seniors we're going to cover more and it will be cheaper because you won't need a supplemental plan. They, they defy the law. I mean, in New York, where my mother-in-law lives, they went into her senior center. We had her all set up with a good original Medicare and a supplemental, and they came in and sold her a Medicare Advantage plan. And in New York, that's illegal. But she didn't want to complain. She didn't want to report it because she didn't want to make any waves at the senior center. She wants them to like her. So, you know, they really prey on our, on our senior citizens. I think we just have to educate them and say, you need to stay in original Medicare. That's what's going to be there for you when you have medical problems. Um, in terms of the high deductible plans, it is like a car with no gas because people are paying their monthly insurance premiums, but then if they don't have the money to meet their deductible, you know, they can't get the care or they get the care and they're stuck with these outrageous bills that they can't handle. And there was just a study looking at uh, breast ca cancer patients and how once they get through the trauma of the breast cancer treatment, then many of them experience the secondary financial trauma of having you know, to pay for that treatment or not getting treatment they need because they can't pay for it. Um, and the impact that that also has on health professionals, when you know that you're prescribing something for your patients, that's going to cause them to have to make decisions about whether they can pay their rent or their food or things like that. Um, again, we just have to be vocal about it with our, with our legislators. And they don't understand health policy. And the reality is that oftentimes their own health uh, LAs, their health legislative assistants, also don't understand health policy. They're hearing from the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance companies who have armies of lobbyists that go into Congress. And so we that's one reason why we have Physicians for National Health Program, is that we train our physicians in health policy. And many of our physicians do go and meet with their members of Congress and their health LAs and educate them about these things. And that's how the change is going to happen. It's going to happen from grassroots, educating the public, standing up as health professionals who are often respected, and, and developing these relationships with our members of Congress and really pushing them to do the right thing. Right, so um, if you look at our spending right now, the majority of it is already coming from public dollars. Uh, so we're spending more in public dollars per person per year right now than other countries spend in total. So we would keep those, those public dollars, you know, continuing to go into our healthcare system. And then on top of that, there have been various proposals that have been put out there. The basic principle we have is that it should be a progressive system so that people are contributing in based on their ability to pay into the system. So it would be an expansion of a tax, uh, probably on employers and employees, by, and making sure that people who are self-employed don't get dinged twice, and then further taxes on, on people who have wealth so that we can start to equalize the system a little bit more. Um, but we're, the, the question, to, in my mind, isn't, you know, how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to afford the system that we have right now? The system that we have is, is rising out of control. Um, they're expecting another 50, you know, that will spend $50 trillion in the next 10 years on healthcare under a single payer system, they're anticipating that would be $32 trillion. So, you know, it just makes sense that if we move to a system where we're not wasting so many of our dollars and we're actually providing care up front, um, that we'll, you know, we'll have a system that functions better. And it'll be taxes, yeah, but you won't have premiums or copays or deductibles. <laughs> Health insurers wouldn't, that's for sure. <laughs> it is a powerful lobby, but I think one thing that we need to understand is that we also have a tremendous amount of power and that while members of Congress do rely on dollars in order to get you know, elected each year, they also rely on votes and they are subject to political pressure. This is how it's happened in every other country where you see that grassroots momentum building. Um, I have also done a lot of studying of how social transformation occurs. And the key ingredients are that you have national consensus around a change, that, that the majority of people in the country support that change. And actually, they recommend a supermajority. 
we're starting to move in that direction. Now we're starting, you know, for a long time, people who identify as Democrats have been highly supportive of a single payer plan, but now we're seeing people who identify as Republicans moving more and more in that direction. The most recent poll showed 52% of, of Republican voters support this. Um, in my own state, which is a very uh, market-based state of Maryland, 55% of our doctors just responded to a poll by our medical society saying they support a single payer system. So we're starting to see it move in that direction. And then in addition to that consensus, you need to have people mobilized who are out there talking to their legislators, putting pressure on them, you know, letting them know that this is what they need to do. And, and that's how any social transformation we've had has happened. So I'm not familiar with what that is. Garrett, is that? Right, so that's one thing, as I said, we've got to you know, put pressure on our legislators to be supportive, but we also need to spread the word um, to other health professionals that there is another solution out there. When I was in practice, I really had no idea about health policy. I just knew that I didn't like the way things were going, and that's when I started getting you know, curious and looking into what was out there. And it took me about three years to get really solid that a single payer system would be the solution that we need. Um, so it takes time. I re recommend visiting the Physicians for National Health Program website. They post new articles regularly. They have fact sheets and all kinds of information there and spreading the word to other physicians that, that there is something out there that, that would change our healthcare system and to the public in general. We do a lot of community events. We do movie nights. Um, a lot of groups that invite us out. I'm sure Kentuckians for single payer. I know you have events going on all the time. Um, so get folks out to those events and, and spread the word. Right. Well, what we've been seeing in the United States for a long time now is that we're not really getting, the pharmaceutical companies that are doing research are, have not been doing a lot of new entities. Most of the research they're doing is taking current chemical structures, tweaking them, patenting them, and then selling them. There's a, another article recently that looked at how our pharmaceutical industry is really becoming a financial industry, that they're spending more of their time focusing on these patents and ways that they can raise the prices. The majority of our research in the U.S. is actually publicly financed. Uh, through the National Institutes of Health. That's where most of the bench research is done. And then that, that gets turned over to the private companies to... Well, I just gave, I just gave uh -huh. uh, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But so 55% still is not being done in the in the private sector. It's being done through the universities and the NIH. Yeah. I mean, I think that 
one of the things that we can do with a with a uh, single payer healthcare system is we can start to set health priorities, and this is how other countries do it. They look at you know, like uh, New Zealand, where Dr. Paris, who's here, who's the president of Physicians for National Health Program, practiced. Every year they sent they set five top health priorities, and then they make a plan to address those health priorities. If we move to a single payer system, we can start to address what are the areas of research that we actually need. What, where do we actually need to fund? Uh, to address our top health problems and and direct the dollars there. And there's a, actually a very good argument for moving our pharmaceutical industry more towards public financing as well, where it can be done in a way that serves, you know, the interests of our health, of our population. But, you know, other countries, I, I haven't really bought the argument that the United States is subsidizing the rest of the world because other countries have ph pharmaceutical companies. They do a lot of research. They just have systems that negotiate with them so that they make a reasonable profit, not an outrageous profit. And if you look at Cuba, which is a country that's been, you know, under a blockade for a long time and they've had to improvise, they've actually lowered their infant mortality um, lower than the United States because they actually looked at, okay, what are the main causes of infant mortality in our country? They found infections were very high. They implemented a public program to reduce infections. They've had to create their own vaccines. They've actually lowered the number of diabetic amputations significantly, I think by two thirds um, through their uh, approach there in Cuba out of necessity. It's not like we can't solve these problems, but we need to have a system that is actually focused on solving these problems in order to do it. Yeah, so it's interesting. So uh, you probably saw that uh, last year, um, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger came out in favor of a single payer healthcare system. They talked about how healthcare is, they called it a tapeworm on American businesses. And so uh, a number of the, Jamie Dimon, I guess, was it Jeff Bezos as well? Or, yeah, and, and Warren Buffett uh, joined together to create something they haven't, they haven't really shared exactly what that is. Um, but they say that they're going to cut out the middleman, which is what we're trying to do, <laughs> cut out that private insurance middleman that gets in the way. Um, I think it's a shame that they're doing that just for their employees and not out there putting money into organizations that could be advocating to do this for everyone in the United States. But we're seeing a lot of experimentation. We see doctors who are, you know, moving to boutique practices or you know, just people are trying to find or moving to secondary profit centers or whatever they can do to kind of survive in this current system. And we say we need to fix the system. Great, yeah, thanks. Sorry, one more. Well, actually, what Canada did was they started out with a national hospital coverage, and then they moved to a national health system, which they call Medicare, was modeled on our, our own Medicare system. But when you do that, you're, you're continuing to maintain the complexity and the high cost and the lack of coordination that we really need to have. I mean, the simplest way to do this is to create one system. Everyone's in it. There's one set of rules. We collect the dollars up front, you know, through a, a progressive tax and then we distribute them as they're needed. That's, that's the simplest for patients, it's the simplest for health professionals, it's the most cost effective way to do it. And we can do it. I mean, we have, unlike in 1965 when we didn't have a system, we now have a national Medicare system. Every provider has a national provider number. So moving to this type of a system will be a much easier transition. 
Great. All of our guests. Wow. We uh, all with uh, Google, uh, your name. Oh, and wow. The date of your thank you so very much. Thank you again for a very provocative talk. Thank you. Wow. Great. Thank you very much.